We're going to continue today uh, in a sermon series I started about a month ago, Go Ye Therefore. That's going to be the fourth sermon in that series. Title of today's sermon is God's Design. And uh, as we talk about a Go Ye Therefore, the Great Commission, in its uh, entirety as we look at it, we've all been called that we're to go out and in the base spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, making disciples. And making disciples means we're teaching people about the understanding and acceptance of the love of Jesus Christ. And uh, with that, I, I started with four basic pieces or understandings of what the gospel is all about. First of all, that we were designed by God, made by God to be in a relationship with Him, and we are accountable to Him, our Creator. The second thing to understand about the basic gospel is we have sin, and that sin has created a separation between us and God. The third thing is God has made a way for that separation to be reconciled. It's what, through what Jesus Christ did on the cross and us putting our faith in both His death and His resurrection. And the fourth thing being that we take hold of that salvation by repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to start today. Uh, as Brad said, we're going to look at a familiar story that Jesus, I'm going to say a familiar truth that Jesus said. But as I prepared today, it just spoke to me in a different way. And um, as we look in the, in the words of John, or it's the words of Jesus in the book of John, it's all in red uh, as we look at it. You know, we get chapter breaks because man has gone in and put chapter breaks inside. But there's a continuing message that Jesus has done here. And I want us to look at the message in its entirety. So if you would, start with me. John chapter 15, we're going to stand and read verse 1 through 8 as we get started with our message. John chapter 15, let's stand as we read the Word of God, verses 1 through 8. Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me." I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And man gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we're in your house. And God, I just thank you for the freedom, the ability, the health to be able to speak your word today. And God, as I proclaim your message, as I read your word, as I expand upon it, God, I ask it not to be of me, but may it be of you. May you use me as your tool, as your vessel. May you speak through me. May you encourage those that need encouraging and convict where conviction is needed. And God, whatever, meet us where we are. And draw us closer to you, for we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Kathy told me today, she says, you got some extra time. I said, that's going to be great. Not going to have a choir special today. I get some extra time. And that's good because I got a five-pointer today. And if you know anything about preaching, that's a lot of preaching. All right? So it's five points, and here it is. It's still the same time. Y'all give me like 20 minutes to preach to get you out on time, so you probably ain't getting out on time. All right, so with that being said, let's understand some things that God tells us in His Word. First of all, I call this God's design. We are God's. As we look at verse 1 through 10 of John chapter 15, there is an analogy of the vine and the branches and fruit. So let's look at verse 1. It says, I, Jesus speaking, am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. That means God is the Father. He goes in verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth fruit. Now ye are clean through through the word which I have spoken, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in me. Ye, except ye abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do, and look at that last word, nothing. So it gives us an analogy that we can understand, a visual. It's really poetry to me when we look at exactly as it goes through from the start to the beginning. 
If you can imagine this, God has decided to take a seed and plant that seed. Now, Jesus has been with God from the beginning. Jesus was not created. Jesus has been and always will be. He is part of God, part of the Trinity, and we should always understand that. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But for our understanding, He gives us an analogy that we can visualize. How many of you have ever seen a grapevine? That's what I'm going to use today as we look at this. Commonly in Scripture, we see grapevines. You know, do you think grapevines are pretty? It only depends if it's full of fruit. But if you take all the fruit away or you look at one that's been pruned, it's like the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. It grows all crooked and all over the place. You know, it's just ugly. But there's an analogy that God decides to use here. With that grapevine, if we're going to have good fruit coming from it, it's going to be planted and it's going to be planted in the best soil that we can. Sometimes they grow in terrible soil, but that's just all by God touching it. But we want it to grow in the best soil. And when a grapevine starts, if you do nothing with it, what do the branches do? They go all over the place, don't they? They end up withering, Miss Yvonne. They end up going all over the place. They look really good, but they got no fruit on them. And then they die and wither and they fall off. And so there's a control that, that the farmer ends up doing, or a guide, you might would say. It's really not control. You know, there's times I've looked at Melody's grapevine, and I've said, I wish that thing would grow more. But I can't control it growing anymore. I'm just not that good a farmer as we look at it, okay? But what we do have to do is we have to put a pole over on this side of the plant, and we have to put a pole over on this side of the plant, and we run little wires or strings back and forth. Why? Because as the vine grows and the branches branch out, we want to give them support. I want you to think of that analogy. We want it to grow in an organized fashion. God is saying Jesus Christ is the vine. He's the trunk that is coming forth. And if you want to live, you've got to be connected to that trunk. You are the branches. And sometimes we have branches that look really good. They're all good and green and pretty, but they create no fruit. Why? Because they don't have a good connection to the vine. And so I could talk about just this and this be our sermon message, but that's not what the message is today. I just want you to understand that God is saying Jesus is the vine. The way to God the Father is through the vine, Jesus Christ. We are the branches. We grow off of our connection to Jesus Christ. When we lose that connection, we wither, we die, we fall off the tree, we're gathered and we're thrown into the fire. Did you get that thought process? But to stay healthy, we have to be connected to the vine which is Jesus Christ. And there's a flow that's going to take place. There's a flow of the Spirit that happens from God through Jesus Christ, His Spirit through us, the branches, and us allowing God to work through us and producing a mighty fruit. He goes on to say this, verse 5 again at the end, for without me you can do nothing. You know, I've tried things on Carney's time and Carney's plan. I have failed miserably. I'm telling you many times, probably hundreds of times, when I decide to do something just me and I'm going to make it all grand, it might work for a little while, but it falls to pieces. Without Jesus Christ, I am and can do nothing. That's why Philippians says, through, uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We can't do all things, but we can do all things that God has called us to do through Christ which strengthens us. He says, without Jesus we are nothing. He goes on, verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. He says again in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done with you. Wait a minute. We're talking about this connection. Now it gets into prayer. I'm all confused. It's all a part of the connection. God is saying this, I design you with a purpose, a specific purpose. And that purpose, number one, is to be in the right relationship with me. And he says, to be in the right relationship with me, you have to be connected to me through Jesus Christ the Son. That's our branches going out. And he says, when you're connected, there's going to be communication and things that are happening that you can call upon me because you're going to be talking to me in my will and I'm going to answer your prayer. First of all, God designed something beautiful. It's God's plan. We're a part of God's plan. And he designed us to be in a close, personal relationship with him. We get this analogy. So he says, call on me and I will answer your prayer. He goes on, and then something happens in verse 11. Sometimes we skip this because it's just one verse. Second point of the day. 
He says, These things I have spoken unto you that, you might, that, you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Think about that. God says, You stay connected to me through my son Jesus that you might have, whose joy did he say? His joy. Jesus is saying, you can have my joy. I don't know about you, but I want the joy of the Father because that's for eternity. You see, I can create happiness. I can decide to go fishing. I don't catch any fish, and then I get upset. See, my happiness fails all that quickly, all right? Or I can decide that I want to have some truck, and I can get that truck, and before you know it, somebody runs into it, or I run into the ditch myself, and my happiness is gone. Happiness is conditional upon what we make over and over. I see some of you laughing because it's happened to you, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. We have temporary happiness through what we create. But joy is eternal. So God says, I've designed you to be in a relationship with me. And in that relationship, you connected to me through Jesus Christ. He says, have Jesus' joy. That's God's joy. And he says, not just a piece of it, what does he say? He says in verse 11, these things I've spoken unto, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. These tabernacles will be overflowing with God's joy. That's a great promise. God has a design for us, and in that design, we are God's. We are to be in a relationship with Him. We are to be full of joy. And then He changes the subject all again. Go with me, verse 12 through about verse 17. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do so whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whosoever shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. So God has a design. His design is that we are God's and in that design, he says, understanding when you receive my love, I'm going to fill you with a joy that you can get from nowhere else. It is more joy than your body can take. And in that, you're going to start growing in your spiritual maturity to an understanding. You have received my love. You love me in return. And you start to love others unconditionally. You know what an unconditional love is? An unconditional love, in this verse, it tells us is when a man will lay down his life for a friend. An unconditional love was God Almighty deciding to allow His Son to come down and live on this earth to be faced with the same sinful situations we are, but not to sin, to remain perfect and give us an example of how to live and ultimately have Himself killed on the cross for ourselves, for our sins. That's an unconditional love. That a God, the God, would come down to this earth and do that for little old me. That's an unconditional love. And so it's a love with long suffering. Even when we spit in God's face, even when we run away from God, we say, where's God at? Well, it's right where we left Him. <laughs> we just ran away from Him. That God will always love us and forgive us. That's an amazing love. And so He calls us. God's got a plan. We're to be in a relationship with Him. If we understand that, we start to receive His joy. We'll be full of joy beyond what we can understand. We start to spiritually mature as we go out and we love one another. And then He throws this in. I'm not going to read the verses, but I'll read one, verse 18. He says, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. That's the fourth thing I want you to understand. If you're connected good to the vine, the world is not going to like you because you don't like what it's about. You don't like the things that are going on. You don't like sin. You don't like what it's about. It's not that we're perfect. We're not. We're just forgiven. Amen? Isn't that a great thing? Say amen again. Amen. amen. We've been forgiven by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so the world hates the very thought of you. In fact, what we get told over and over, you're just an uppity guy. Your nose is always up in the air, and the world is waiting for you to fall short so they can broadcast it to everybody. Did you see so-and-so in the sin they did? Let's just expand it all out. They hate you when they don't know Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, don't be surprised. They killed me. Why do you think they wouldn't hate you for loving me? Is what Jesus says. And so he says all of that in verses 18 through verses 
25. We are God's. He has a plan for us. We're full of joy if we allow His joy to come in. Our spiritual understanding tells us that we are to love one another and that the world will hate us. Why? Because the world is ran by the devil. Scripture plainly tells us that He is the prince of the world. Next thing I want us to look at, though, and this is where the key of the message comes. They hadn't had it yet, but Jesus is getting ready to promise something. If we look at verse 26, the comforter comes into play. And he says this in verse 26 and 27. But when the comforter is come, that's the Holy Spirit. He says, when the comforter is come, who I will send unto you from the Father. The Holy Spirit is of Jesus Christ from the Father. Even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye shall also, you and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. He's saying there's a connection to the believer in Christ. He says that Spirit's going to come. Now, in chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, there's some other great material, but I don't have time to read it to you. So go with me to verse 8. He says in verse 8, and when He has come, He is the Comforter again. He is the Holy Spirit, which we now have. He says, when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It goes on, verse 9, of sin, because they believe not on Me. Verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to My Father and ye see Me no more. And verse 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So let's look at this understanding all together. God says, I have a design. It's a wonderful plan. We don't get to change the design. It's God's. God is God and we are not. But God has a design. And He says, in this design I have created you with so much love that I allow you free will. Your free choice. You can decide not to believe in the Father if that's you. And you will, you will suffer the consequence of it. But He didn't make us robots. He gave us love. He gave us an ability to decide upon ourselves. And so He says, I made you in a design to be in a relationship with me. And if you will be in that relationship with me, you will have unbelievable joy. A joy that nobody else can explain. You will be full of joy. More joy than you can stand. Now some of you are thinking... I'm connected to the Father, and I've experienced some of that joy, but I don't have it right now. If you go back to the understanding of the vine and the branches, he said there's some not connected to the vine that wither and break, and they're gathered up and thrown in the fire. But then he says there is some, the vine that is connected, or the branches that are connected to the vine, that he pruneth. You know what that pruning is? Those are those things that we have in our lives that we really don't want. That even though I'm connected to the Father, it's the tragedy that comes in my life. It is the loss of job. It is the drug addiction. It is the family disturbance. It is all of those things, our bodies failing, all of those things that come. And God says, I'm just pruning you. Stay connected to the vine. You know, if you think back to that analogy, that picture I said of, of, of that ugly vine, <laughs> that thing comes out. And if you ever seen one pruned, you know, when it's pruned, you can cut yourself on that. It's jagged. It's just ugly. They just come up and cut pieces off of it, you know. It's an ugly thing. But you give one more season, and what happens? There's beautiful greenery and grapes that come. And so don't think because you're not full of joy right now, maybe you've experienced it and you're wondering, if you're still connected to the vine, you know it. God's just pruning you a bit. Listen to the pruning. Ask God, what can I receive out of this? And may I continue in the growing of the loving one another, understanding that the world hates me and that you've got a job for me if I would just allow the Comforter to come and work through me. Now let's get back to that Comforter. He says this, verse 8, And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. You know, when we think of go ye therefore... To go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, the basic message. I, as a young pastor, still a young pastor today, today's my, not today specific, I'm in my 11th year in the ministry. There's so much I do not know. I feel like a failure every day. I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. And I probably have failed for some of you in here, but I love you and I didn't mean it. I can promise you that. 
But I can tell you this, as God continues to show us and as we grow, it's just amazing to see His truth come together more and more. And in my young days as a pastor, I looked at ways to do that great commission. I tried to copy what somebody else did. It doesn't matter if God didn't originate it, it doesn't matter. It's not to copy somebody else's work. It's just like us. Sometimes we want to be somebody else. God didn't want you to be anybody else. If he did, he'd have made you that way. You were to be the person that God made. But in evangelism, I tried all kinds of programs and thoughts and different things, you know, and the ones that I did, they failed miserably. They just failed miserably because they weren't connected to the vine even though they were for the right purpose. What I had to understand was exactly what this says. God, through His Spirit, convicts the world of sin. God, through His Spirit, convicts individuals of judgment. God, through His Spirit, convicts people of righteousness. You know what our job is? It's not to judge. It's not for us to go cast judgment on where you were last night. He says our job is to love one another. To love one another. He's already going to take care of the conviction that goes in there. And so he says, as we look at these verses, he says this in, in verse number 9, of sin because they believe not on me. Every person, whether a Christian or not, knows right or wrong. They know right or wrong. They already know when they have done something right and when they have failed and done something wrong. They don't need you to tell them. You know, I can remember Hannah and, and Grace and, and poor Carl. I can remember things in their young life where they had to call me up or where I found out something they knew was going to disappoint me. And you know, they're just waiting for a blistering. And I have wrongly blistered them before, physically and <laughs> mentally. But I remember one particular thing with one of my kids, and they were just waiting. And they said, what are you going to say? I don't have to say anything, do I? Because they already know. They already know. The world knows, even those that don't know Jesus, whether they're living like they should or not. The second thing he says here, the Spirit will convict them of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. The world says, I don't know how to live. If you don't believe the world has that question, go to Barnes and Nobles and see how many self-help books you can find on ways to live. I got one. It's right here. It is the self-help book. We can go to Dr. Phil. We can go to Donahue when he was still around and Oprah Winfrey and we can find out another 50 religions from her. Who knows where we can go and all the wise things people wouldn't tell us. But I tell you where you need to go, it is to Jesus Christ in His Word. And so when people say, I don't know how to live, it's very easy for us to just say, well, you know, I get my righteousness, my understanding of how to live from the Bible. Well, you put everything in stock in that Bible? Absolutely, I do. What do you put your stock in? Well, I get a piece from over here and a piece from over here and a piece from over there. So you don't know what you believe or what to believe. It's up to your own decision to discern whether it's what's good and what's not good. I put total stock in what God's Word has told me. Am I naive? Maybe so. But you know what? The third thing that it says the Holy Spirit will convict us of is where we're going to spend eternity. It is judgment. And I will tell you this, I am by faith am going to put my life in the hand of what this Word says in my Savior Jesus Christ. It's just that simple for us Christians. It's not a go ram it down somebody's throat. It's not a judgment. We stand for righteousness with our behavior, but don't forget We've got to love one another. That doesn't mean we have to put up with something that's wrong. But it does mean we love one another. Jesus says, i got a design, God's design. We are God's. You are designed to be in a relationship with God Almighty. That relationship, we receive God's love, we love Him in return. In that alone starts to feel joy in our lives. The very next thing He tells us is, is that after that joy is that we're to love one another. We're to take the love from the Father that's coming back and forth between us. And it goes out to others. And as we're going out to others, He says, call on me and I'm going to be talking to you and we're going to be able to pray together. There's going to be understanding. I'm going to give you direction. We love one another and understand why you're loving one another. You're going to meet obstacles. The world hates you. And that's okay. You know, part of our problems as Christians is we expect an unbeliever to act like a believer. 
We shouldn't. Because you're either under control of the Holy Spirit or you're under control of the devil. We should expect people that do not have the Holy Spirit in their life to be filled with the devil because it's one or the other. We shouldn't expect them to be different. The world's going to hate you. But he says the Comforter has a great purpose. God loves us and designed us. His Spirit comes to us. We're to be full of joy of that. We're to love one another, understand the world hates you. But we're to be conduits. You see, that Spirit comes through us being connected to the vine. But whether fruit or not happens off of our branches is not whether we go out and work hard. It is whether we make ourselves available and sensitive to the Spirit working through us. You see, it's God that does the work. That's the beautiful thing. This whole connection of what He says, hey, understand, yes, this is the way I've designed it, but I want to work through you. And if you will allow the Spirit to lead you, you're going to be so full of joy, you don't know what to do. You know, this is part one. Part two will come next Sunday. But I'll ask you this. I don't know why God has laid this upon my heart. About three weeks ago, this came up. It was different. It's inserted. But I know God meant it, and He meant it for a reason. So I don't know if, if uh, you have never been the branch connected to the vine. You've just been out growing, doing your own thing, and keep withering and dying. Or whether you have been connected and you're no longer connected, or whether you're connected and there's great fruit going through. I don't know where you are in the life, but God does. And He wanted this message for you today. And so if He's asking you in some way to respond, then I ask you to do it. As we stand together, Kathy's going to play our hymn of decision. I just ask you to do whatever God lays upon your heart. Would you respond to His calling today as we stand and sing our hymn of decision?